All right, now we're in 2 Timothy, and we're all the way through to chapter number uh, 2, and you're just before the famous verse. Now, I've covered the verses in verse 12 about if we suffer, we shall also reign. I want to go back over that just for this. Um, Notice when he says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. That is denying you the right to rule and reign with Christ. That's not your salvation. Uh, if you deny him before the Father, then I mean you deny him before men, he'll deny you before the Father. That has to do with something different than you. That's a Jewish time period. It's nothing to do with you. Once you're saved, if you were to deny him, he can't deny you entrance into heaven. Now, you need to understand that. That's your eternal security. I'm not advising you to do that. But I'm simply saying to you that once you're saved, you're sealed by him under the day of redemption. It's not by your works that you're sealed to the day of redemption. In Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 8 and 9, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That not of works is more than just the fact that you're not saved by working. Hey, brother, what in the world are you doing down here? Good to see you all. Why don't you call me? God bless you, brother. Glad to see us. Brother Gunther and his family here from up in Michigan. Anyway, you have to understand this, ladies and gentlemen. Excuse me for that. That people are now trying to add to that by saying that if you really are saved, then you're going to do whatever the following list of things is to do to prove that you're saved. The proof that you're saved is found by believing what the Bible says. For by grace are you saved through what? Period. Not now that I'm saved, I know I'm saved because I read my Bible, I pray, I study, I go to church, I dress right, I spit white, I do this, I do that. Now, most people will say, well, what you're teaching then is that it's okay for you to sin. No, he'll blister your, bu- uh, pardon me, your backside. Right. It, it, he, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So what the Lord tells you is, is that he'll get on to you for doing things that are wrong to do, but you don't lose your salvation. Working for Jesus Christ may give you peace of mind and may make you think that because I'm doing that, I am. But if you're at it for a very long period of time, you will know in your heart, just because you go to church, a lot of times that's reputation. A lot of times it's repetition, meaning that you just do it because you've just always done it. It's not proof that you're saved. If it was proof that you're saved, then everybody that attends church or oh, no, preacher, that's only an independent Baptist. We're not brighters. We don't believe that somebody can't be saved that doesn't go to a Baptist church. It's not about being Baptist or Catholic or, or any of the other. It's about being saved. Now, well, I just don't believe, well, that's because you think you're in the right church. You know what Catholics believe? They don't believe you can be saved and go to a Baptist church. They believe you have to be in a Catholic church. You know what Seventh-day Adventists believe? They believe that you, in order for you to be saved, you've got to attend church on Saturday. Because they call that the Sabbath day, even though the Sabbath is for a sign to the Jew. I want to hammer this point home to you because if you don't understand the difference in your standing in your state, you're going to stay messed up as a soup sandwich for all your Christian life. Because sooner or later, you are going to have those moments in time where you are not acting like you should be acting. And you're going to look in the mirror and go, well, why am I thinking that? And why am I thinking this? And why am I bitter? And why am I angry? And why am I... It'll go far and beyond just, you know, well, I'm not smoking, drinking, and cussing, and chewing. Well, you don't do that because you're worried about your health. I don't chew tobacco because I I don't want to get mouth cancer, and I don't smoke because I don't want to get lung cancer, and I don't want to smell like a a cigarette smoke, and I don't want my wife to kiss me and she'd think she's licking an ashtray and all that kind of stuff, and I don't drink because I don't want cirrhosis of the liver, or I don't want to get arrested and get put in jail, and those kind of things. All that can be justified as just good moral behavior. You came up, if you came up in the 50s, you came up in a time period where people thought because they went to church and because they lived a moral life, that meant didn't cheat on their wife and didn't rob, rape, and steal, that they were, they had to be saved just because they went to church. Back in those days, when you joined the church, they considered that being saved. Back in the old days, the Southern Baptists were more brighters than the independent Baptist brighters that are north of here up in Tennessee, north Georgia, and Carolina. Back in those days, the people would come down, they'd have an altar call. They got that from the, the crusades and stuff. And people would come down there and the first thing they say, would you like to join the church? Not, do you want to get saved? And they would baptize you into the church. We're going to have a baptism here in a couple of three weeks and baptize a fellow led to the Lord back here a, a week, a two weeks ago and he wants to get baptized and I'll baptize him. He has to understand, I'm not baptizing him into the church. Right. 
He's in the body of Christ right now. You say, what? The baptism there is by the Spirit. It has nothing to do with getting dunked in water. Now, I believe in being baptized. I think it's a good testimony. But if he dies right now, he'll be out from the body and present with the Lord. Amen. It has nothing to do with something ceremonial. Do you, do you understand where I'm coming from? It's important that you get a hold of that. You say, why? Because right now, the resurgence of what's called kind of a retreaded Calvinism is rising to the surface and says, now, we believe in eternal security if you really are saved. What do you mean, if I really am saved? I'm saved. I did what the book said. Well, if you really are, you go to church, you read your Bible, you witness, you tithe, you, you know, and the list is endless. No, you're saved if you did what the Bible said to do. You're saved by grace through faith. Well, but preacher, listen, ladies and gentlemen, I don't mean to be rude to you, but you're not my judge when it comes to salvation. You can't tell by what I do if I'm saved or not. You say, but you're a preacher. That don't mean nothing. Don't you know that the ministers of Satan are there and that an angel, the, the devil can appear as an angel of light? You can't tell. I don't know why it is that people want to look at somebody and think you can determine what the position of somebody's soul is. Can you see my soul? Nope. How would you know if my soul is saved? You sure can't tell it by looking at my body. You say, well, you look saved. What does a saved man look like? You got on a shirt and tie? Well, go, go look at the majority of your uh, 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 doctors in the hospital right now or your faculties on the school grounds and things like that. They got on a shirt and tie. They got on a dress code. That's what they're supposed to wear, right? Yep. How do you know that? Because I got a Bible. You can't tell. Do you understand? The suffering there, that if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. That reigning is the millennial reign of Christ. And the suffering is, is for the sake of Jesus Christ, doing what he told you to do and getting hammered for it. That doesn't mean you go beat yourself with a flog or something like that. And it doesn't mean you walk on glass or you have to say so many Hail, say so many Hail Marys and Our Fathers. It doesn't mean you put yourself in a position to do it. If you live for Jesus Christ, all yea, that all, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's going to come sooner or later. You don't have to look for it. Sometimes the devil will pick on you. You sometimes get a physical malady or something that goes on in your life, and you're thinking, why am I going through this? And the devil said, well, I figured a good way to pick on you. It happened to Job. It happened to Job. Just because you're sick doesn't mean that you're, you know, that it's all because of some bad uh, physical health habit you have. Sometimes you're sick because the Lord's letting the devil pick on you for a little while. You say, what? If you suffer, you shall also reign. When you suffer, you go through things, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, so that you can minister to other people that have gone through that. There are some of you folks in here that have had great losses in different kinds of circumstances and situations where you are ten times the benefit to someone else than I would be. I can tell them the passages to turn to, but you've lived it. Some of you have been through some stuff. You've lived it. You're down there where they live in the trenches. You're the, you're the one that can minister to them. Don't let that go to waste. God put you through some things or allowed some things to happen or some things took place in your life. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Understand that God allowed you to go through that stuff. And now what can happen is you are able to use what you went through to minister to other people. Uh, there's nothing worse than somebody coming into you and giving you an 828 without an illustration to go with it. You know, you know, put their arm around you while you're looking in the casket of a loved one and say, well, we know all things work together for good. Well, you know what? You feel like I'm going to have you join him in the casket. <laughs> don't tell me you don't feel that way. That's ridiculous for somebody to walk up and say that. I keep threatening. I, I would never do it, but I keep threatening. I've got a list of some things that I've written down. Stupid things people say at funerals. Amen. Don't he look natural? <laughs> Why would you even say that? Don't he look natural? He looks dead. I don't care how much makeup you put on him and how much embalming fluid you pump through him, he's dead. If he looked like that when he was alive, wow, he must have had a pretty rough life. Don't he look natural? No. Aren't the flowers beautiful? You trying to make the funeral look like something it's not? I mean, what... Thank you for the flowers. appreciate that. But that's what we do in sympathy. But do you understand? Just stupid things. So here's what you have to understand. In 2 Timothy 2, and again in Romans chapter number 8, and a number of other places I've given you, to make sense of your suffering, understand 
that out there in eternity at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a reward for it. And the reward will come by letting you rule and reign with Jesus Christ during the millennium and then thereafter. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Your standing right now is you're seated with Him in heavenly places. That means as far as He's concerned, you're already there. Your state can change from moment to moment. And that's the thing you've got to grab a hold of. That's the thing you have to understand. When you go through things down here, it's not an indicator of whether you are or are not saved. For instance, if you don't handle things the way you ought to handle things, it doesn't mean you're not saved. Did you do what God said to do? Now, the only way you'll doubt your salvation is twofold, I believe. This is what I think. This is my opinion. Number one, you look at your own physical life and it causes you to wonder, well, if I'm really saved, why am I still doing that? The fact of the matter is, is that some of you are more worried about somebody smoking or drinking, but you have no control over your own tongue or your appetite. And you're just as guilty, if not more so, and have done more damage than they have because you can't control your mouth or you can't control your slander or your bitterness or your lying or any number of other things. Good preaching for Sunday school. See, it's, it's always looking at what somebody else is doing instead of looking inside. So number one, you look at yourself. Number two, you doubt what God said. If God said, this is how you get saved, and that's what you did, you're saved. Yes. Say, well, I, I just, I'm just i just not sure about it. Well, you either believe what, you, what he wrote or not. But don't look at your life for, for whether or not you are, because you know you can lie. You say, why? Somebody walks up to you, how are you today? I'm fine. You liar, you liar, you liar. <laughs> You're not fine. Doesn't mean you're lost, right? right? So don't look at yourself to determine whether or not you're saved. Not if you're going to do that. Now, that's what you just need to get a hold of that in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And don't let anybody ever talk you out of that. Verse 13 is the commentary on it. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. When you became saved, you became bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He can't deny himself. He doesn't take out a, a scalpel and cut you out of his body. You're not in the palm of his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. You're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You are joined together, fitly put together, he said. He doesn't excise himself and become, if I could paint, I wish I could, I wish I could paint sometimes. I would paint how a lot of people paint uh, uh, people getting into Jesus Christ. I'd have them come in and be part of the body and then I'd have him look like Frankenstein. I'd have him the, worst, the, the most horrible looking monstrosity you've ever seen in your life. Because these preachers try to tell you that, well, you were in and now you lost it, so he cut you out of his body. So in Corinthians, he tells you one of you is the eye and one of you is the ear and one of you is the head. Well, then you just get in transplants all the time. Then you get out and then you get back in. Well, then when I get back in, do I get to go back where I came from or do I have to go to another place? How many times do you cut him and bring him out and put him back in and all that? No, you're in the body of Christ. Literally. You're physically in his body, but you're separated from him right now. Now, if you can grab a hold of that thing, it'll help you to understand and get the peace of mind of knowing when you mess up, fess up. And then get up and go on. It won't be the last time. I wish I, it won't be the last time unless you die. And then that'll be the last time. But until you're dead or the rapture, you need to understand that's part of the Christian life. I'm not justifying or condoning it. Some of you keep doing the same besetting sins because you're too, stu- too, too stubborn to change. <laughs> we better get back in the book here. Notice he says this in verse number 14 of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words uh, to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now I want to just hit this thing about striving and I'm going to tell you some things. You know what he says? He said, strive not with the words. Be careful what you argue about. Be careful what you argue about. Take your Bible and come over, if you will, please. Just come on down in verse number 25, same passage. In meekness instructing those that oppose what? Themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover what? Themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know what he says? A servant of the Lord, verse 24, must not strive. What's the point of an argument with somebody that's not interested in change? Look in Titus chapter number 3. Titus chapter number 3. 
He says, but avoid foolish questions down in verse number 9. Genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law. Why? Who would have ever thought arguing about the Bible was unprofitable and vain? That's what he says if you're reading it. You got a King James Bible? You believe it, don't you? Look what he just said. They're unprofitable and vain. Why? Because most times the individual arguing with you that is a heretic, the Bible said, after the first and second admonition, do what? Don't argue with them anymore. Why? Look at it. Knowing that he that is such is subverted, sinning against himself. He's got a root problem, not a fruit problem. The problem is in the root. The problem's in his heart. So you can't change him because he doesn't want to be changed. So he can't convince you and you can't convince him. You know what the Lord said? Give him two shots at it and stop arguing with him. Now, that doesn't mean give up on prodigals and quit praying. That doesn't mean go quit for praying for people that you know that are wayward and doing wrong and backslidden and, and family members and all that other kind of stuff. What he's saying to you there is, is that there's no point in you arguing with somebody who you're not going to change. They got a heart problem. So we accept the fact. Jehovah's Witness comes to your door. They tap on your door and say, you know, here's your watchtower. I don't even give them two. I say, I'm a Baptist preacher. I believe in the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ, and I believe in the pre-rapture of the, the rapture before the tribulation of the church. I don't believe in 144,000 of Jehovah's Witnesses coming out here. I believe they're male virgin Jews, according to Revelation 7 and Revelation 40. By then, they're already doing this. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't give them, I don't give them an opportunity. I, say, I don't say thank you for coming by or anything else. Now, what I would like to say is, is that if you come back here again, then... I might greet you in a different manner. <laughs> they irritate me. Now, don't bother y'all. Y'all are like, oh, well, they're just sharing the faith. No, they're not. They're damning people to hell is what they're doing. And they're only out there because they're trying to prove they're saved. They're on their mission. What's well, a great way to get people to go out and spread the gospel is to put them in bondage to say, well, if you really are, I'll get you a pair of dark pants and a white shirt and a tie and a bicycle and a little helmet and ride around and tell people and everybody will believe you're saved. Right. Right. That's what the, Mor- uh, the Mormons do. <laughs> you know what he just said to you? He said, there's a point in time, ladies and gentlemen, where arguing with people doesn't benefit you at all. It's unprofitable and vain. Yep. You know what it does? It frees you up. It's not written to free them up. It's written to take the burden off of you that you realize, I don't have to tell them anymore. I've already gave them twice. And so the Lord said, not three strikes, you're out. Two strikes, you're out. The Lord said, I don't have to argue with you anymore. Now, let me give you a little clue. Get out of the way. The Holy Spirit can take it from there. But if the Holy Spirit can't convince them, do you really think you can? I mean, even if they're a family member. Even if they're your own personal family, your own kids, or you really think that you can convince them, if they, if they won't listen to the Holy Spirit, you really think you can convince them beyond that? I can tell you how to make your family dinners a little bit more pleasant. Stop trying to change everybody's table manners at the table. Yes. You're coming together for family, what are you coming together for? To eat. Stop trying to use that as your opportunity to try to change them into what you think. You say, what? You're just going to have an argument. If they do something you don't like, get up from the table and say, have a nice day. See you later. But see, you, you, sometimes you feel this pressure on you that I have to go out there and tell these people. You've already told them twice. Good. You're done. You say, what? They got a heart problem. So you're under no further obligation. How about that? The Lord telling you, there's no pressure on you. You can't win anybody. Amen. How many of you have heard that? Let's go, let's go soul winning. Yeah. Heard that before? Yeah. You don't win any souls. You can tell them the gospel. I'm for that. I'm for you giving them the gospel. Give them your testimony. That's a great thing. But the Holy Spirit saves them. You don't. (laughs) You couldn't save anybody. I mean, you know, well, I I had them to the point. I had to close the deal. One guy was telling me. And one guy's doing an illustration on how to do soul winning. He said, and sometimes, you know, you get out with them. And and I'm thinking, they taught us that when you're interviewing suspects. (laughs) Get out on their level, you know, and get close and personal with them and invade their body space and all that kind of stuff. You'd be surprised if you can get people to tell you about stuff like that. What kind of foolishness is that? You can be sincere, can't you? But you tell somebody about Jesus Christ and you know what you do? It's not your job to close the deal. Wouldn't you like to pray? Oh, wouldn't you like to pray? Wouldn't you like to pray? 
I remember that old preacher giving an illustration and talking about uh, women in 1 Peter chapter number 3 and he was talking along the lines of how they have a tendency to talk too much and they do. And uh, there was an old uh, 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 fishing captain there, uh, a uh, shrimp boat captain that he knew down there. His name was Red or something. I can't remember the guy's name now. But he said he was down there and he finally got a chance to do it. He said he's red as a lobster. I remember the illustration perfectly. And he said, we're sitting out there drinking some iced tea underneath the tree out there in the hot day. And the, we're sitting in the shade out there. And he's got the net strung out all over the place and all that. And he said, I'm dealing with him about his soul. And he said he was married to a good woman. She was a nice lady. She went to church all the time and she was a good woman and that kind of thing. And she came out there and he said, just about the time I got ready to reach my hand out there and said, now, I think his name was Jack. Jack, wouldn't you like to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? And she rocked up and she had that handkerchief, he said, and she was twisting it around and around. Oh, Jack. Oh, Jack. Don't you want to pray? Don't you want to pray, Jack? Oh, don't you want to pray? And he said, just like that. He said, that man turned to her and said, get your nose out of my business. And he said, it's like the Holy Spirit just flew out right across those oak trees. She meant well. She intended well. But just like that, you say, well, what? Well, <laughs> you say, who's doing the saving? Not that lady, no matter how bad she cared about him. I don't know if that captain ever got saved or didn't get saved. Sure missed a good opportunity there. You say, why? Because the lady's concerned for the thing. She opened her mouth when she should have kept it quiet. So, well, he, did she sent him to hell. No, she didn't send him to hell. He made the decision to reject and used her for an excuse, and he had plenty of other opportunities. The point is, is that when you witness to somebody, witness to them and leave it alone. You don't push them. Would you like to pray? Many times. Here recently, many times. Would you like to pray? I'd like to pray. Would you like to pray in your own words? I don't know what words to say. Okay, now you can help them. Well, I can help you to pray, but you have to believe it in your heart. And if I say something that you can't believe and you can't in good, clear conscience say, then don't repeat it. And then you go through that. But they don't know how to pray because maybe they're, you know, I've, I've had them come and try to get their fingers lined up and make sure everything's perfect and get down and, and kneel this way. Catholic, they don't know any better. They get down on the rail at the end of the thing and do that kind of a deal. And then they pray. They start with our Father. What? That's all they know. We well, don't. That, that's a Catholic prayer. Okay. But you can help them, but you can't save them. They have to believe it in their heart. I don't know. I, they, they say something upward of 90% of people that are saved have never led a soul to Christ. I don't know if those numbers are true or not. I don't know where they would get that number. They say less than 70% have ever even passed out a track of saved people. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm sure it's not true of you. But my point is this. is My point is, is that when he tells you, to not to uh, fuss and argue about certain scriptures and stuff like that. You want to remember this story. You want to remember the story of Abraham and Lot. Remember Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw the plains were well watered and so on and so forth. And a little while only Abraham comes up there and they get to talking. And the next thing you know what kind of breaks into an argument. And Abraham being the older of the two, the uncle of the young boy Lot there of his nephew. He said, uh, you know something, you go ahead and pick whatever you want and I'll take the other. Because we don't have any business arguing in front of these heathens. You want to remember that story. Sometimes you're arguing with somebody over some doctrinal issue and lost people are watching you. Yep. Backslidden people are watching you. And all of a sudden, you know, that's exactly why I don't go to church. Right there. See, right there. Just right there. Yep. At the dinner table, when you go to Outback or the shrimp house or the fish house or the chicken house or the Mexican place or the Sino Cat or wherever you go on a Sunday afternoon after uh, uh, church service is over, that's not a good place to have an open discussion about somebody parking in your parking place or sitting in your pew. It's not a good place to talk about the preacher's dry as cracker juice today. He's off a half a bubble. You know, he's out of plum or whatever it might be. You say, why? Lost people listening. Lost people listening. You know, it may be true. Maybe everything you're saying is 100% true. I might even agree with what you're saying. But it's not the right place to discuss those things. You say, what? Well, lost people watching. Lost people watching. Somebody's sitting there around you and, and, and listening to what you have to say to justify doing what they're doing. All right, now he said to put you in remembrance of some things. If you want to write these down or underline, look if you will, please. I'll give you five or six things here that he gives you. Now, when he says that, 
He's using a method or a manner called exposition or an expository manner of preaching or teaching them. He said, put them in remembrance. And then he'll walk through the passage. What do we need to remember? Look at verse number 3. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. You see that? <clears throat> number 2, verse 4. Don't get entangled with the rest of the world. No man warreth entangled himself with the affairs of the world. He's giving you instruction. That's, that's called an exposition. If you're an expository preacher, you're getting your points directly from the passage. The passage is speaking. I'm not speaking. You say, no, I'm vocalizing. But the passage is talking. Whenever you get ready to do an outline, when it comes to sermon preparation and things like that, you need to let the passage talk. Not your preference. Not your prejudice. Not making, well, I want to make the, my political statement from using this if my people who are called by my name that will humble themselves and repent and get twice baked over in the microwave and then I'll dump out my blessings on them and all that other stuff. You better let the passage talk. You better be careful about praying an Israel prayer on today. I have a lot of people asking me now, what do you think about the virus and what do you think about this and that and the other and so on and so forth. I'm not a doctor. That's a medical question. What do you think is going to happen? I'm not a doctor. Do you think the media is lying to you or not? Probably. (laughs) But what part are they lying about? I'm, I'm, I'm not in the media. I'm going to show you today what the Bible says. You say about the virus? No. <laughs> no, I'm going to show you some things you can have confidence in when you can't have confidence in anything else. But you have to learn to let the, the passage talk. Now, let me help you with something, if I could, please. This is just in a manner of instruction. Remember, he says instruction and righteousness. When it comes time for you to read your Bible, don't read into the Bible. Don't go to the Bible with a preconceived notion, I already know what he's going to say. Okay? When it comes to reading the Bible, you sit down and you read the Bible, not because you have to, but because you want to, and you let the Bible speak to you. Remember this, the Bible's reading you, you're not reading it. It is the only book in the universe that reads you while you read it. And if you read it with the wrong heart, you will get the wrong interpretation and break your full neck. That's what, how you explain false doctrine and things like that. You say, why? The Bible's absolute truth, but it can be affected by how you look into that mirror. If your mirror is cracked by your own perception, by your own prejudice, by your own preferences, by your own politics, there's four P's, make you a sermon out of that. If you're looking that way, ladies and gentlemen, then you're going to look at the passage and not see it rightly divided. That's what's important for you to understand. All right, verse number four. No man that warreth entangled himself. He's giving you some things to do it. He says in verse, <coughs> excuse me, verse number five, uh, you have to strive lawfully. You've got to do things the right way. doesn't matter if everybody does things the right way or not. doesn't matter if everybody else cheats or not. Gentlemen, this has to do with character. This means I have to do what's right, whether it's popular or not popular. Whether I get my way, don't get my way. You say, what is it? You're measuring your character. Strive lawfully. Is it right? If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. Don't blame somebody else for that. If it's wrong, you shouldn't do it. The problem is nowadays, men and men, I'm I'm saying men. I know men more than I know women. The Bible says you dwell the woman according to knowledge, not understanding. I didn't even say anything. I just quoted the verse to you. But you know what I do know? I know men, and I know this. We generally don't pray about something because most times we already know the answer. That's right. And sometimes in life, as a man, you know what you have to learn to do? You have to learn to do things because it's right to do. It's right to provide for your family. The Bible says, He that provideth not for his own is worse than an infidel. Should you provide or send her out every day? Just a thought. You know what that provision is, gentlemen? That provision is more than just monetary things. You're supposed to provide. Are you providing? I don't know if you are or not. I couldn't tell you if you are. She doesn't even know if you are. You get to the judgment seat of Christ, he'll determine whether or not we provided. All right, he said, no man that worth and entangled himself. And then in verse number five, he said, you got to do it lawfully. You got to do it legally. You got to do it in the right way. Verse number six, he talks about a husbandman there. You got to do it with sweat. You got to put effort into it. 
You're not going to have a crop if you don't go till the ground, take out the rocks and stuff like that, put down the mill organite, put the seed down, and then cover it back up and then wait for the rain and the sunshine and keep the weeds pulled out. I don't know if any of you have ever done much farming at all. I don't care if you do it on a tractor. You're going to sweat if you're going to work out in the field. So he says in verse number 6, he says, you're going to have to understand that there's going to be along the way some sweat involved. And then he says in verse number uh, 7, I'm sorry, verse number, yeah, 7 and 8. And then he says, consider what I say. The Lord give the understanding. I'll remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to what? You know what he just said? Don't forget where you got, how you got to where you're at. Don't forget how you got where you are. You drop the at there. Don't forget how you got to where you're at. You understand. You're from the South. You know what I'm trying to say. It's not coming out the right way. And the more times I repeat it, the worse it gets. <laughs> Verse number 9. Be prepared to suffer trouble. You see Paul? You know why Paul suffered trouble? Because of his gospel. There's a demonic opposition to you trying to do something for Jesus Christ. God tells you to do something and it doesn't make any sense to you. He says to Abraham, you know what he says? He said, go look for a, a, a city whose builder and maker is God. Where do you want me to go? Well, I'll tell you every day when you wake up. Where's my GPS? <laughs> well, you talk about having to be in fellowship with the Lord. Suppose you got in your car and got ready to go to work and your, job, your place of your job changed every day and it depended upon your connection with the Lord instead of your connection with the cell tower. You had to wait in the morning to get direction from the Lord before you know which way to go. You're pulling up tent stakes. Sarah comes out, baby, where are we going today? I don't know yet. We're going northeast, south, or west. I don't know yet, baby. I couldn't tell you. Uh, I got, ain't got a signal. I only got a half a bar. No GPS. The satellite's down. What if it depended like it did for him in his relationship with the Lord? You know what he said right there? He said, remember this, when you're going to give the gospel, guess what's going to happen? You're going to suffer trouble. There's going to be problems that are going to come your way. Look, if you will, please, down in verse number 12, understand that there's benefits for suffering. Well, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Come on in, Miss St. Clair. Good to see you from way up there in the northern country. You're not fooling me. You came back down here for sun instead of snow. <clears throat> Have a seat. It's nice seeing you. <laughs> That's Miss Debbie St. Clair. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, here's what the Lord does. He tells you in Job, man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. That's all men across the board. But he says a Christian's going to suffer. But then you know what he tells you? But if you suffer, you'll reign with him. He's telling you that there's something more important than what's going on right now. I can't. I, I can't seem to get you to understand that it's not about the here and now. The fault in most Christians today is that they can't see the future. So they live for the here and now. They don't live for eternity. They don't think about eternity. They don't think about decisions impacting eternity. They have no concept of that. And here's the second thing. Eternity is not real enough to them to affect them in the present. And if you can't do that, there's no way to keep anybody coming to church or reading their Bible or praying because if you can't see that eternity is what you're living for, not the here and now, not your creature comforts, not whether or not you get pleasure, not whether or not you get uh, 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 prosperity and those kind of things. If you can't see that, nobody can convince you to try to keep you in church to try to keep you reading the Bible, to try to keep you praying, to try to keep you giving. Why would you give money to something to just put up a building if you didn't think it was for something eternally? Why would you come to church if you didn't think it was for something eternally? It doesn't help you be any better, not as a regular person, because you know you can go off the rails if you want to. Does it make sense to you? You know what keeps you is there's something out there. There's something out there. There's something out there. You make those decisions in light of the judgment seat of Christ, as I have said and have taught you for years here. You'll always come out on the right side of the thing, but it will not make sense to other people. They will not understand it. You're saying, well, what are you doing? I'm doing what I believe the Lord wants me to do. Oh, oh, you're one of those. Yeah, I am. And they laugh, they mock, and they make fun of you. And then the next thing you know, you're at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord said, I appreciate the decision you made. 
All right, come on down a little bit further now. Now, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Look in verse number 15. Verse 15. So that's an expository or an exposition of the things Paul said to put him in remembrance of. You constantly remind him, Timothy. And then he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's not just written to Timothy. That's written to all Christians. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. That is a command, not a suggestion. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, your Bible will constantly look like it has contradictions in it. Example, in the Old Testament, he tells you that you can't eat anything that doesn't have fins and scales. You can't eat pork, you can't eat lobster, you can't eat shellfish. I know it's a a, a much-used illustration, but it illustrates the point. Okay, well, so that's where your Muslims get, well, I can't have pork or anything. And somebody says, well, can they play football because it's a pigskin and that kind of stuff like that. They make all kind of jokes about those kind of things. Or, you know, one of the things they did to degrade Muslims was is they put pork in their food without them knowing about it and make them stick their finger down their throat and throw up and all that, that kind of uh, foolishness. There are many Jews today that believe the same thing. They believe in dietary laws. So does that mean you should go out and intentionally offend them? Jews don't eat pork. Maybe it's good for you not to eat pork. It tastes good. I mean, if you can eat it, eat it. That's your business. You say, but he says don't eat it. Well, he says for them not to eat it under the law. But then in Timothy, he said every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it receive a prayer and thanksgiving. Every creature? Yeah, every creature. You want to eat snails? Eat them. I mean, if that... Trips your trigger. Make sure you got enough garlic and butter on them to make whatever that is go down. I don't know. I, I know why they put them in butter so they slide down easier. <laughs> you want to eat oysters. You want to eat shrimp. You want to eat lobster. You want to eat pigs. That's, you can eat all that stuff. You say, why? Because if you rightly divide your Bible, you know you're not under the command of the Old Testament law. All right, how about a sacrifice? Well, they got to bring a turtle dove. They have to bring a pigeon. They have to bring a, a he goat. They have to bring a ram. They have to bring a lamb. They have to bring a wave offering. They have to bring a drink offering. They have to bring a sheave offering. They have to bring a hand offering. It's like, which offering do I bring for what? I got one offering, so one sacrifice. That's Jesus Christ. I don't have to bring any other offerings. Good, preacher. I'm not putting anything in the plate. Okay, whatever. <laughs> You'll get that in a second. You don't have to bring a sacrifice. You say, why? Jesus Christ is a sacrifice once, 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 once for all. Not slain before the foundation of the world and then slain again on Calvary. That kind of foolishness. So now what we're doing, I'm giving you rightly dividing. Rightly dividing is this. Who's talking? Is it God? Is it the devil? Or is it a man? Who are they talking to? Is it the Jew? Is it the Gentile? Is it the church? You take that Jew and Gentile and you start using that, the passages for the Jew and the Gentile and try to put them down on the church, you're going to find yourself in a mess. Yes. Right now you've got people living under Old Testament promises to the nation of Israel. Not even going back before the time of Abraham. I'm talking about, I'm talking about from Abraham, Moses, the law, the whole nine yards. They're taking those promises and they're preaching them every day and people are hopping all over it and they're thinking that I'm going to get the prosperity and I'm going to get this and that and the other. That's for the Jew under a whole different time frame. You get salvation by the grace of God. You know why they got all those blessings for doing right? Because they didn't get everything by grace through faith. So God showed them mercy by saying, if you do what's right to do, I'll show it to you by blessing you and by blessing your land and blessing your children and blessing this and, and all and so on and so forth. I'll take the other one. I'd rather do without and have my salvation in his hand, not in my own. I'd rather take salvation as a free gift than to have to try to earn it or try to keep it. You say, well, you know, well, why would you want to try to claim those promises? Now, here's what will mess you up like a soup sandwich. I don't know if you've had that before, but if you've been in the South very long at all, you know what a soup sandwich is. It will mess you up like a soup sandwich. You're serving the Lord. You're doing the best you know how to do, and you're waiting on the prosperity, and your bank account's down, and your blood pressure's up. There's always one thing or the other. You, you kill yourself making a living to earn money. And then you get older, you're trying to take everything you spent to get your health back. Right? You work, you work like a dog, you get everything, it's like, I finally got there. Then all of a sudden it's like, you know, come to the hospital, come to the doctor, come here, come there. You're losing this, you're losing that. You work and get all this stuff. And then somebody breaks in and gets it, and then you're thinking, I need to downsize. And then you're thinking, where did I get all this stuff? 
All this stuff, it's just here, you know, and there's a box from the last time you moved and it's been sitting right there in that box. You didn't even know you had it, you never even missed it. You could have thrown it in the trash, no, but you keep it just in case because, you know, maybe you might need it one day or somebody might give you a dollar for the whole box at a garage sale. Here's the thing you have to understand. If you start looking at Old Testament promises and try to apply it in the church age, you're not going to be long for staying faithful because you're going to realize, you know what, I'm staying faithful and I'm not getting anything for it. You say, what is it? It's just not rightly dividing. So who's talking and who are they talking to? That's the main two things you want to look at when you're reading a passage. Um, in uh, the book of Hebrews, which I'm fixing to have to teach a whole class on Hebrews, but in the book of Hebrews, when you start through the book of Hebrews, man, you talk about getting messed up when you're transitioning. Hebrews is probably one of the toughest books in all the Bible. Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews, they're, Hebrews, they're transitional book. You go through the book of Hebrews and you start reading about people losing their salvation. Well, if you don't pay attention to who's talking and who they're talking to, you know what you think? I've lost it and it's impossible to renew me again to repentance. Yep. I can't repent and I can't get right. It's in the Bible. I'll give you a good one over in the book of Revelation. All liars find their place in the lake of fire. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> all liars. <coughs> That's all individuals that are not saved individuals. I can't be a liar anymore. I can be a Christian that lies. But I'm a saved man now. That lie will be attached to my flesh. It'll break my fellowship with the Lord, but it's not attached to my soul. You say, well, my soul's not connected to me anymore. I know you can't tell it, but I had an operation when I was seven. It's an invisible incision. It cut my soul away from my body. Seven years of age, he cut me loose. He set me free. And since that time, everything I did is attributed to my flesh and may break my fellowship, but my soul is his son and I'm saved. I'm in the body of Christ. Now, you have to grab a hold of that. If you don't, you know what's going to wind up happening to you. You're going to wind up doubting things. I'm going to pick it up there tonight, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, because now what we have to do is part of studying gives you the ability to look at verse 16 quickly. But shun what? Profane and vain babblings. Isn't that what he said? Well, now, how would I know what they are if I don't rightly divide the book? Because the ones he's fixing to talk to you about are all millennialists. They're teaching the resurrection has already occurred. How would I know that if I didn't rightly divide the Bible? See how it all fits together? He says, study to show yourself approved. And then he says, shun vain and profane babble, they will increase to more ungodliness. And then he uses the two examples there. He's talking about a doctrinal issue. He's not even talking about uh, things that you might consider to be ungodly. He's saying the ungodliness there is being doctrinally wrong. How am I going to know I'm doctrinally straight if I don't rightly divide the Bible? So he, he tells you to rightly divide, and then he says, these individuals who've been coming in here and trying to teach like they did in Thessalonica and like they did in Galatia, and they're saying to you, oh, the rap, it's already taken place. There is no such a thing as a rapture, and, and the resurrection is spiritual. Some were teaching, and some were teaching the resurrection in Revelation 20 had already taken place, and so therefore there was no resurrection. How would you know that if you don't rightly divide the Bible? Because I can tell you that resurrection hadn't taken place yet. And if you don't rightly divide the Bible, then you wind up like some of the brethren right now that are running off the deep end and there is no Jew and there never has been a Jew and that's all a conspiracy and, and then you get into the anti-governmental foolishness and all because you're applying Old Testament stuff and New Testament Christianity. It won't work. Father, bless your word and thank you for the privilege of being here. Pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service. In the name of Jesus Christ.